Okay, hello. Uh, I'm Adam Jones, and if you're seeing this, you are watching my backup video. Um, depending on how the weekend goes, maybe my primary video. Anyway, it's good to see all of you, virtually or not, here at uh, IEEE VR, so let me just get started. Uh, today I want to talk to you about our paper, Latency Detection and Illusion in a Head-Worn Virtual Environment. This is work that was done by two of my grad students, uh, Colin Roth and Ethan Luckett, in the High Fidelity Virtual Environments Lab, the High Five Lab, at the University of Mississippi. So this is actually a fairly short paper, and I have a fairly substantial amount of time to talk, so uh, <clears throat> might as well get started by digressing a little bit. Uh, I love the slides for the conference this year. I usually don't use the slide template they provide, uh, but this year it looks sharp. And one of the things I really like about it is it reminds me very much of the 90s sci-fi movie, Canadian sci-fi television series, actually, Earth Final Conflict. The little swirly dude over here on the side looks like, uh, looks like the aliens from that show. Kind of cool. If any of my students are watching, they're laughing right now because they're realizing that Dr. Jones makes sci-fi jokes in real life, too. So, <clears throat> anyway, enough with that. Let's, let's move on. Uh, back at IEEE Virtual Reality 2009, maybe 2008, my, my gut says 2008, but um, I, I think it maybe it was 2009, uh, Steve Ellis made the comment during uh, a panel that every paper at IEEE Virtual Reality uh, should talk about latency, otherwise not be accepted to the conference. And of course, he was joking, and everyone laughed, you know, and that was, that was great. Uh, but in reality, latency is a big problem for us because it, it's unavoidable. It's something that we can't get out of our systems. It's, it's the speed of light problem. We're limited by physics itself. Uh, we see and perceive the world. Well, we see the world at the speed of light. We don't perceive the world at the speed of light subtle distinction. Uh, so anything we add in between our physical movements and when the light that reflects those movements enters our eyes, like rendering hardware and screens and operating systems and those kind of things, everything we put in between our movement and our vision is going to add some additional delay. So latency is always going to be there for us. <clears throat> but now the interesting thing about, uh, Perception is there's uh, usually some fuzziness about it. Uh, people have boundaries within which they can't tell that something changes. And uh, it's the same for temperature and pressure and touch and taste. And it's also the same for latency. Uh, as a matter of fact, Edelstein et al. in 2003 ran a study looking to find like what is the minimum detectable change in latency that, that, that people can discern. And... Uh, they found that people can detect uh, changes in latency of around 16 milliseconds if they're experienced uh, VR users. And uh, a little bit higher, but not much higher. I think around 20 milliseconds uh, if you're a non-experienced user. But still, people are very sensitive to the introduction of latency. And one of the things that we're doing in this, uh, this study is uh, generally sort of, well, yeah, loosely replicating Edelstein's uh, uh, study, which, which, by the way, Steve Ellis... Uh, the uh, every paper should be a latency paper guy uh, was was a co-author on as well. And we're replicating those uh, procedures here with an off-the-shelf modern display, specifically an HTC Vive. And we'll we'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, we started looking at latency at IEEE VR 2019, where we were measuring the latency of the HTC Vive. So empirically ver empirically verifying the latency that the Vive supposedly had. Uh, it's remarkably hard to find any concrete documentation on the end-to-end -end latency of the Vive. Uh, the best resources are actually when developers from Valve give talks about uh, about the Vive. And so there's a really good GDC talk um, where they they talk about the the, the latency and, and how how they do their rendering and everything. And uh, the latency they state there is that uh, it it's about uh, 22 milliseconds from motion to photons. In the HTC Vive, and uh, we we did a, a study last uh, last year here uh, that that measured that, and you can sort of see uh, see the plots here where we're measuring how uh, essentially we had the a head on a pendulum with the Vive on it and a, uh, uh, a a brightness reference underneath. It was a monitor, and uh, when you'd swing the head back and forth, you'd see oscillations in brightness in the virtual world and the real world. <clears throat> 
and uh, looking at the difference between the peaks between those, you could measure how long it took from when the movement was instigated to when the motion occurred in the, the visual apparatus. Now, if we have any electrical engineers in the crowd, you know this already. Uh, for those of you who aren't, and, and it, I had to be introduced to it myself, an oscilloscope is the best tool you can possibly have. If you want to measure something very, very tiny and very, very reliably, an oscilloscope is like the most amazing tool ever. So just plugging that piece of equipment. Now, what we're doing here is we're not empirically measuring the latency of the Vive, but we use those measurements in uh, in our, our, uh, our study. Uh, what we're doing is we're trying to determine how much additional latency can be put on top of this before people notice that the world is lagging behind them. So we ran a small user study, uh, recruited 10 participants, uh, all of whom were, were either novice or expert VR users. It was, it was pretty widespread, actually, but everyone had at least seen virtual reality before. And we recruited these folks from uh, the University of Mississippi campus. Uh, each participant saw 40 trials. We tried uh, tested five levels of latency, uh, base system latency, so the 22 milliseconds, one additional frame of delay, up to four additional frames of delay. And each delay was repeated eight times per participant. Uh, between each trial, we introduced a five, 500 millisecond black screen uh, that masked the transition from one latency stage to another. Uh, we counterbalanced the presentation of these using a restricted random shuffle, uh, meaning that when you saw one level of latency, the next level of latency will be randomly selected from all other levels of rate latency, but not the one you're currently seeing. So you'd never see the same latency in two trials back to back. Uh, the equipment we used uh, was an HTC Vive and uh, a digital metronome, which uh, we'll, we'll talk about, about what that was doing here in a moment. And uh, the software was uh, Unity 3D plus Steam VR. Now, Unity 3D and Steam VR, they want you to have a good experience in the virtual world. Makes sense. Uh, they don't want you to perceive latency. Matter of fact, they go to great lengths to reduce the perceived latency. And here we are, we're trying to use their tools to produce latency. So we had to do a little bit of creative engineering to make this happen. Uh, our first thought was, why don't we render frames to textures, cue those, and then display X number of delayed frames? Uh, that makes sense, and uh, on maybe a higher-end system than we had, that might work. But uh, dealing with that many render textures queued up, uh, we ended up with very unpredictable behavior. Uh, the, the, the timing between frames was, was very erratic, usually much longer than a single frame of delay. So uh, we went with a different route. Uh, we ended up with sort of uh, time delaying the uh, transformations applied to the camera. So essentially we had two camera rigs. One was the Steam VR camera rig uh, that was uh, moving around in real time in the scene. And then we had the rendered camera rig, which was delayed. So essentially we were queuing uh, the transformation matrices captured from the headset while it was moving around and then applying X number of frames delay of that transformation matrix to the other camera rig. So as one moved around, the other one followed it around, delayed by X number of frames of, uh, of refresh. Uh, this actually worked really well. Uh, frame rates were very reliable. We, uh, we had really good performance out of it. There is a downside to this, though. Uh, say you wanted to look at latency uh, or how people respond to objects that are moving with latency. The latency only applies to your view, not other objects in the scene. So even though the camera was delayed, objects in the scene would still be moving in real time. Now the scene that we had was static. Nothing was changing. The only thing moving in the scene was the observer itself. Uh, so this wasn't really an issue for the, the study that we were doing. But if you want to implement this yourself, please you know, be aware that um, the, the transformation queuing of the headset uh, might not give you the delay that you're interested in. So the actual procedure that the participants did. So we had people sitting in a swiveling desk chair with the Vive on their head, and we had a digital metronome playing at 50 beats per minute. So knock, 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 knock. And with the knocks, the participants were instructed to swivel their chair side to side over roughly a 90 degree angle. And uh, <clears throat> what they were instructed to do was as they're swinging back and forth, 
try to notice whether or not the world is delayed. And if the world looks delayed relative to your physical movements, you would then click the left button of a mouse. If it looked as though it was not delayed, so that the visual movements were in sync, perfect sync with your, your physical movements, then you click the right mouse button. And so we were doing a a, a two uh, a force uh, two two <laughs> two option forced choice task here, uh, and they did this for forty trials. And uh, you can see a uh, you can see an illustration here. I don't know if my mouse pointer is actually showing up, but uh, you can see an illustration here of a person sitting in the chair and sort of what they were seeing. They were seeing an empty version of our lab, uh, so they'd be looking at the lab and moving side to side. And what we found uh, was actually pretty well in line with what uh, Edelstein in 2003 found. Uh, the point of subjective equality uh, for the responses was, was around 1.71 frames. Uh, this comes out to approximately 18.8 uh, 18, 18 milliseconds. So very close to that 16 to 20 millisecond area that uh, they found in, two, in 2003. Uh, you know, not very surprising, looking at the the plot and the error bars, uh, there was a significant effect across conditions. Um, now, one of the things that we also did, we recorded uh, response time. So one of the interesting things about response time is it can be used as an implicit measure of the difficulty of a task. So uh, effectively saying that the longer it takes for someone to complete the task, the more difficult it is. And so we looked at the response time for... Uh, determining whether or not a frame was delayed or not. And this was actually really interesting. So uh, there was a, a significant change between uh, <clears throat> uh, response times uh, in between the two frame and three fra two and three frames of delay trials. So you can see from no frames up to two frames, there was a, a steady increase in uh, in response time. And around that uh, two frames of delay, which would be about 22 milliseconds, so fairly close to that 18.8 uh, uh, millisecond PSE, uh, we see a sudden drop in response time. So once you get up to that 22 millisecond mark, you're, uh, it's getting harder and harder for you to actually determine whether or not a change has taken place. But once you move a bit beyond that, it's very easy and the responses are much quicker. So, uh, yeah, that was kind of an interesting, interesting finding. Uh, <clears throat> another thing that we found was a potential uh, latency illusion. And I've, I've got to actually give credit to Reviewer 3 for this. We, we weren't calling it a latency illusion in the original draft of the paper. And then, you know, people, people like to make jokes about, oh, Reviewer 3 this, Reviewer 3 that. Well, our Reviewer 3 was stellar. So if you're in the crowd, calling you out. Uh, and uh, recommended that we, we refer to this as uh, a latency illusion. And I like that. It's kind of cool. Uh, what, what we found was that there was a difference in the probability of saying a response was delayed, or saying that the frames were delayed, uh, depending on what the previous trial was. So if your previous trial had higher latency than your current trial, so between trials there was a decrease in latency, you were much less likely to detect whether or not they're much less likely to detect that there was in fact a delay. Uh, and if you went the other direction, uh, your previous trial was a lower latency than your current trial. You're much more likely to detect it. So you're more sensitive. Uh, this has some practical implications uh, that uh, I think I've got actually some bullets in the discussion on the next slide, but uh, Again, looking at the looking at the the plot here with uh, the error bars, you, you it's, it's pretty obviously a a significant effect, uh, strongly so actually. Okay, so uh, essentially what we did here is we replicated the uh, findings of Edelstein et al. but with modern headsets. One of the things this implies is that latency studies uh, using legacy hardware, uh, so previously published stuff, you know, is probably still applicable to to the to the modern headsets. And if you think about that, it's not terribly surprising. Some of the technology is different, but things like this are, are less technology dependent and more more human perception dependent. Uh, so it's not terribly surprising. Uh, one of the really interesting things is this potential latency illusion. Uh, now, our study wasn't designed specifically to look at this. This was a surprise finding. So uh, additional work needs to be invested in like looking at this because it's kind of cool. Uh, but one of the things it implies uh, 
is that if you, you you can sort of mask high latency in your system. So if you already have a system that has somewhat high latency, probably probably not too high, there's probably a threshold involved. But if you have a system that's already somewhat high in latency, if you artificially inflate that latency up front and then gradually step the users down to the base system latency, these results imply that uh, you might be able to get away with with people uh, not detecting as much latency as they normally would. Uh, I've I've been sort of jokingly calling this uh, latency decompression. So it's uh, sort of like uh, sort of like coming back from uh, a deep dive, you know, so you don't get the bends slowly uh, uh, coming back up to pressure. Uh, so we're going to conclude our talk there. Uh, if you have any questions about this, uh, I may be live right now with you, and if so, ask away. Uh, otherwise, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. The contract information is there, and uh, I hope you all have an excellent rest of the conference. Signing off.